Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with John Williams on corruption. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and uh, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week I'm very happy to welcome a guest here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. Today I'm happy to welcome John Williams, the Chief Executive Officer of GOPAC, the uh, Global Organization of Parliamentarians, Parliamentarians Against Corruption, and himself a distinguished former parliamentarian. Welcome. Thank you, David. And uh, corruption is a big topic. Um, we have a lot to discuss, but before we do, perhaps you could just let our audience know a bit about your organization and uh, its background and what it's attempting to do. Well, GOPAC, the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption, the name says a lot, parliamentarians are against corruption around the globe, but what do we do? Well, first of all, the focus of GOPAC uh, fundamentals are peer support for parliamentarians. Fighting corruption around the world can be a dangerous game. And uh, what they need to know when they're fighting corruption, and sometimes lives are on the line here, that they don't stand alone. And also, of course, if you want to move anything forward in the political field, you've got to build a coalition. So it's all about peer support, building a coalition. Second thing is, is education for parliamentarians. We were all something before we were elected to be members of parliament, but that didn't mean to say we knew how to be a member of parliament. Everybody else goes to school and university and a college to learn their trade, but we just get elected and handed the keys to the country and we go for it. Mm -hmm. So we have education for parliamentarians so they understand what their ro role and responsibility is. And third, leadership. Leadership, mm -hmm. of course, is so important in the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, was this a Canadian initiative at the outset? Yeah, we started this in the House of Commons in 2002. I was the chair of the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons. Uh, actually, I was invited to a conference by the World Bank uh, who were starting to get into the anti-corruption agenda at that time. And uh, one thing led to another and we started this organization in the House of Commons 2002 with uh, 170 parliamentarians from all around the world came to start the organization. Mm -hmm. And now it's a civil society organization? Well, it's uh, registered as an NGO, right. but I don't like the title NGO, which is a non-governmental organization, because parliamentarians are governmental. part of government. Uh, they're not government, but they're parliament. Uh -huh. But they're part of the governance structure, and that's the important thing, because parliament has the constitutional power and authority that nobody else has to hold executives accountable. Mm -hmm. And that is a fundamental objective of GOPAC is to ensure that governments are held accountable by their parliaments on behalf of their people, as we do here in Canada, and then hopefully one day democracy will break out and everybody will be prosperous and free. Right. So are there particular parts of the world or particular countries that you find yourself spending most of your time uh, and energies on? Well, I just come back from the Middle East, uh, Beirut and Amman. We had our annual general meeting of our ARPAC, Arab Region Parliamentarians Against Corruption. We have chapters in the national parliaments all across North Africa throughout the Middle East. Beirut, uh, Kuwait, uh, we have some members in Egypt. Uh, Yemen is exactly, believe it or not, doing phenomenally well. We even have members in Iraq uh, mm -hmm. who are saying, what is this organization? How can it help me? because these are dangerous places to be in to fight corruption. What tools do I need? For example, Yemen has just recently passed access to information legislation. Absolutely vital to a, a free and open society mm -hmm. sponsored by the Yemen Parliamentarians Against Corruption who had a, a tent on the main square right. to tell people about what they were doing. So we got that. Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, is a problem with corruption. Uh, the World Bank says that Nigeria alone has lost $500 billion in the last 20 years, disappeared. Mm. It's and yet amazing. the people live a dollar a day and less. Right. Well, very good. Well, thanks for the orientation, and we'll be back in a second to speak more with John Williams. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So I'm interested to, to hear more about the specific issues you tackle, but let's start with the generic term, corruption. Uh, we know what that means intuitively, but uh, 
it's not a word that necessarily means the same thing to everybody on the planet. A, a good friend of mine was involved in promoting anti-corruption good practice in Africa, and he told me stories of uh, having discussions with West African parliamentarians and trying to explain that once you come into office, you shouldn't sort of take the state coffers and hand them over to your friends and family. And he said the first reaction he got was, well, of course, that's exactly what you should do because it's a moral obligation to help your friends and family if you can. Uh, how do you actually get everybody on the same page when it comes to an understanding of corruption? Is there sort of a canonical definition? And do you find that it travels? Or is it really difficult to sort of persuade people that they should think of corruption in that way? Well, there's two, two fundamental kinds, David. There is the $20 to the cops so you don't get a ticket and we don't worry about that at all. There is the grand corruption where a billion here and a billion there and pretty soon it adds up to some real money. That is where we want to focus because that is the leaders of the countries mm -hmm. that have access to this kind of money. So that's where we focus. Now, it's a fairly simple concept that the guy at the top, the prime minister or the president, is honest and has integrity at his core. He will not tolerate corruption all the way down the line. But it's also the other way around. If the guy at the top is corrupt to the core, he will not tolerate honesty and integrity down below and he will move it away. Uh -huh. So we have to work with a coalition of parliamentarians, sometimes small in number, who want to do it right, but in politics we have to build that coalition so we can be a force that is reckoned with. So we get the benefit and support from World Bank, uh -huh. UNDP, CEDA, our own International Development Agency, USAID, other organizations are putting money into this uh, because they recognize that development in, in the of the parliament is the way to developing democratic governance. And people really don't like to see the money being stolen from their poor and the people taking it are rich. All right. And there's some obvious cases, you know, giant palaces uh, in the yeah. middle of nowhere or offshore bank accounts. And Luxury an trips to London and Zurich and so on. Right. But there's these other cases where you know, monies would be allocated in one way rather than another based on things other than what we in Canada would consider sound, transparent, accountable public practice. Is, I imagine that's kind of a hard sell. Or do parliamentarians come to your organization sort of predisposed to agree with you on what would count as corruption? We have to be careful that the parliamentarians come to us are committed to good governance and fighting corruption. They don't want the label to put on the pen to put on the lapel and say, hey, I'm clean, when they are not. Right. It's a danger for our organization. But we have to take the risk mm -hmm. because there are enough people out there who are looking for this. So, you know, the World Bank, for example, just canceled their $3 billion loan to build a bridge in Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh is horribly poor, horribly corrupt. The bank said there's no point in us putting up $3 billion because most of it is going to go in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And while they need the bridge, it's not going to get built. So where, where does the parliamentarians come in? We take a look and say, what are our strengths? Parliamentary oversight is a fundamental responsibility of parliament to ensure that government is accountable to the people. That's fundamentally Parliament's role, and I did that as a chair of the Public Accounts Committee, and we need others to be able to do the same thing. Anti-money laundering legislation. We've just been talking to the major banks here in Canada, we'll be talking to more around the world, about you have an obligation to support anti-money laundering legislation because it's all being channeled through your institution. So you have to talk and address these issues, and they're coming on board to help us. We have resource revenue transparency. Oil and gas and minerals and gold and diamonds. We all hear about blood diamonds and gold disappearing because the system is such that the people at the top can fix the rules to make sure they get a lot more than their share. So parliamentarians have, should be at the forefront of these fights. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they say, I've got to feed my family, and it's a big family, so I need all the money, and there's not a lot for anybody else, and that is how the system has worked for far too long. And to change that is a, a daunting task, but we're up to the challenge. Very good. We'll be back again in a moment with John Williams. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.
Welcome back. So I'm curious to know a bit more about exactly how you accomplish the mission, uh, the education and the outreach. I understand that GOPAC uh, has a number of task forces devoted to specific issues. Could you tell us a bit about the issues and how those task forces operate? Yes, gladly, David. Uh, the, we have, for example, as I mentioned, anti-money laundering. There is uh, necessary to have anti-money laundering, la anti laundering legislation on the books to set up a, f a financial monitoring program, which we have here in Canada. For example, every time you write a check and make financial transactions, these are all are computerized, supervised by computer programs. And if they see something out of line, it gets flagged, it takes a look at that, and then you may be getting a knock on the door saying, why did you take that half a million dollars and put it in the bank in the Caribbean? So uh, we have financial supervision here in this country, but mm -hmm. the corrupt countries don't have it. Mm -hmm. And the corrupt countries need it. And help them write legislation. Oh yeah, we have model legislation that they can use. So they can just adopt it, it can be customized for their own particular cultural situation, but they need that legislation. So we organize GOPAC into global task forces, such as one for anti-money laundering, and one for the UN Convention Against Corruption, and one for resource revenue transparency. These are members of parliament from the different regions around the world for example, one in Latin America, and one in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, and one in the Middle East. That does two things. One, it gives us parliamentarians who are culturally orientated to that part of the world. Two, of course, uh, they will speak the language of that part of the world, and of course, it keeps the travel bill down very substantially, so we don't send people out to these parts of the world from wherever. So, and it gets the parliamentarians engaged. Then we try and provide them with resources so that we talk to the banks and maybe they can help us by their expertise on anti-money laundering. We talk to the resource extractive industries and say, you folks know a lot about this. Help us educate the parliamentarians on this particular uh, agenda. Identify the gaps and what legislation is needed. Push to get that in place. Develop parliamentary oversight to make sure that it's not just a piece of legislation on the books that nothing happens with, and we start to move the agenda forward. Mm. Now this sounds like it could potentially be expensive to do properly. Could you tell us oh. a bit how you fund the operation? Is it largely volunteer based? Is it uh, all funded the by governments or contributions? Yeah, all the members of parliament uh, act, uh, participating, of course, uh, are volunteers because they're paid by their parliaments for mm -hmm. being a member of parliament, and this is very much part of their responsibilities, therefore they don't get paid. Right. Uh, we do have a secretariat. We are funded at this point in time for our core funding by the government of Kuwait. Right. The chairman of our board is a former member of parliament from Kuwait, and therefore he lobbied his government to give us core funding. But as I say, we get program funding from other organizations such as USAID, World Bank, CETA. Uh, uh, we're hoping that DFID in the UK will give us some program money. Uh, the European Union is the largest international donor in the world these days, so we have overtures to them to break through and uh, develop a, a program with them to ensure that we can help, especially the EU accession countries, who are not getting into the EU because they're corrupt. Right. And therefore, it would seem only natural that the EU would put money into uh, anti-corruption measures in these countries that would like to get into the EU. Right. So uh, w the idea is that we get program funding and we get core funding. Right. So intuitively it sounds as though GOPAC would be most effective when you've got a critical mass of parliamentarians in a country that can help address that country's challenges. Have you found that the really hard case <coughs> countries are the ones where it's difficult to get committed, effective groups of parliamentarians to to go with the flow, to, to see the, the purpose and conduct the mission? Actually, it's the other way around. Oh, that's fascinating. In the developed world, it's hard to get people, parliamentarians, to engage on an anti-corruption agenda because, hey, there's no corruption around here. Right. Well, there's well, corruption. So they think. <laughs> that's right. We only have to take a look about, read the Montreal Papers these days right. exactly. to find out about corruption in Canada. It's everywhere. Where there's greed, there is corruption. And I haven't found anywhere in the world where there hasn't been a little bit of greed growing around. So corruption is likely not that far away if the rules are lax and unenforced, people do it. Mm. So 
Uh, it's everywhere. But it's but it not takes a certain amount of bravery, I suppose, in, on the part of parliamentarians in some countries. It does. I was in Zimbabwe uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, after the elections there where the par parliament actually, uh, Mugabe lost control of his parliament. These are all young guys. And I was kind of, why is it all young guys who are the parliamentarians? And these were the young people, brave enough to put their name on the ballot, thinking that they could be assassinated by election day. Mm. And they won. And they said, now what are we supposed to do? Were any of them assassinated? No, no, but uh, they thought that they could be. There were a number of killings during that election, but none of the candidates were killed as far as I believe. Oh, very good. But the point is, danger lurks around the corner. I imagine so. We'll be back one more time with John Williams. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So I wonder if we could step back a little bit and talk about sort of the global governance of good practice, of good governance, I guess you might say, and anti-corruption activities. GOPAC is you know, one organization committed to pursuing the anti-corruption agenda in a certain way. Uh, there's a panoply of other organizations, yeah. the Transparency International and so on and so on. Uh, what's the lay of the land like now? Is it largely sort of non-governmental actors in this business, or is it sort of drifting toward increasingly becoming something that governments are taking over from civil society and how would you like to see the global governance of this issue evolve over the next 15, well, 20 years? Well, it is evolving as we speak. Uh, when I first became a member of parliament in 1993, believe it or not, bribery was a tax deductible expense here in Canada if you put it down as a facilitation payment. But it was bribery and it was tax deductible. O overseas bribery. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Or even a facilitation payment in Canada okay. would have been acceptable too. Interesting. Now we send you to jail for doing that kind of stuff. So we have moved a long way. 20 years ago, the World Bank had yet to mention the word corruption, which they started doing in 1995. 2002, the United Nations developed the UN Convention Against Corruption. And the OECD, the Organization for Economic Security and Development, of, has uh, their member countries, around 25 or 30, all now have to have anti-corruption legislation and anti-bribery of, uh, bribery of foreign officials legislation on the books mm -hmm. to make it a crime in their own country if you bribe somebody in the undeveloped world. And this is a major advance mm -hmm. because when countries in the United States, Canada, UK and wherever else are out bribing somebody in South Sahara and Sub-Saharan Africa thinking that we'll get away with, it, away with it. That becomes a crime in their own country and our laws apply and we have a lot more faith in our court system than we do in some of these other ones. But the mean, that's because we are saying this is what it takes to send the message corruption will not be tolerated. And you mentioned a few times that national legislation is key in the fight against corruption. What about international law, international treaty law, customary international law? Are these also relevant bodies of law for this fight, or basically the, it's all come down to the states and they have to have their own laws in place for this to work It all well? comes down to legislation in each particular country. It has to be a crime in each particular country. But the UN Convention Against Corruption is a standardized methodology to say if it's a corruption, uh, if it's a crime here, it's a crime over there. And if it's a crime in the two different countries, then extradition applies. Now we started, the World Bank has started a stolen asset recovery program to get these millions and billions back to where they were stolen from. Uh, and a lot of them, of course, are in the stock markets and real estate of the developed world, protected by the rule of law in the developed world, now that it's been laundered and looks a little clean. And that money has to be pried out and sent back to where it comes from. So we need the pressure, we need the NGOs, we need the Transparency International, we need the Resource Revenue Watch, we need all the other NGOs who have now formed a coalition called the UN Coalition of Civil Society Coalition to lobby governments to ensure that they move forward. Now, parliamentarians are neither NGOs 
and they're not government. But they have a clear and serious role to play because, as I say, they are the only ones with the constitutional authority and responsibility to ensure the government does it properly. So you've got government, you've got GOPAC, parliamentarians, you've got NGOs, you've got business now are stepping up and saying, we want to see a level playing field. You have the World Economic Forum through their uh, initiative, Par Partnership Against Corruption Initiative. So these are all springing up and the, we're getting more and more control over this, and this agenda. And I think uh, it was the World Bank and said over about two and a half trillion dollars a year disappears through corruption around the world. So it's a massive amount mm. of money. Is there a good story behind the World Bank taking a leadership role in this? Or was that a result of particular entrepreneurs in the World Bank who thought this was something that had to be addressed well, at the international a, institutional level? There's an interesting story there, David. I was talking to James Wolfenson, who was the president of the World Bank a number of years ago. And I was complimenting him and say, on the fact that under his watch, the bank started talking about corruption. And they hadn't done so before because corruption was considered to be a domestic problem and the World Bank's charter prevented them from being involved in domestic issues. So they right. didn't see it. Right. And he said to me, yes, he said, when I became the president of the World Bank, I wanted to talk about corruption. And they said, oh, no, no, Mr. President, you can't go there outside our field. So he said, I took out my pen, I scratched out the word domestic, and I wrote in the word economic. And then I found the whole world wanted to talk about corruption. Interesting. One man changed the world. Yeah. I mean, one could imagine that the IMF might also have taken this on as a signature issue because conditionality has to do a lot with making sure that you know, fiscal houses are in order in part by making sure that <laughs> funds stay in the country where they're supposed to be and that they flow <laughs> well, the right way. Well, this is right. Uh, but the resource revenues, uh, money laundering, uh, it was in the paper just yesterday about the president of South Africa, $20 million of taxpayers' money to renovate his house for his four wives and ten kids or whatever he's got, right. and uh, not according to the rules but because he dominates the polit political scene in South Africa, he thinks he can get away with it. All over the papers, he thinks he's immune. Well, we have to stop that. We have to say immunity is not there mm -hmm. for parliamentarians and prime ministers and presidents who think that they can empty the treasury and put it all into their own pocket. That has to stop. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much for coming in and explaining your organization and its work, and uh, good luck to it, very important file. Uh, I've appreciated it and I've learned a great deal and I hope our audience would agree also. And to our audience, thank you for joining us this week and join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.